Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for May 18th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cyber Security Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is, is your code safe from attack? With uh, Barton Miller and Alyssa Heyman. Bart is a professor of computer sciences at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Alyssa is an associate professor at Autonomous University of Barcelona. Both are also members of Trusted CI, so we're happy to welcome them today. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, um, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So you can just click on there and I will be following the chat during the presentation. And we have time at the end uh, to take questions as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Bart. Bart, welcome. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Let's get set up here. Okay, are we sharing okay now? I can see your PowerPoint. Okay, ex <clears throat> excellent. Okay, give me just one more second to get this thing. Mm -hmm. There we go. <clears throat> okay, good morning, everyone or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. It's virtual world, we never know. Um, Alyssa and I have been spending a lot of time digging into other people's software, helping them find vulnerabilities and fixing them. And we do that regularly under trusted CI and, under, and have done that under other auspices. We've looked into such things as Wireshark for DHS and Department of Justice, Chrome for Google, HD Condor and Globus for the CI community. And even soft, we've even looked into software that controls 40% of the container shipping ports in the world. Um, so today what we do, we want to share with you some insights of why you might want to think about the security of your software. So <clears throat> we know that companies and governments are always under attack and they need to worry about cybersecurity. But the question is, why does the science community need to worry about this? So uh, we have some very specific concerns in science that are similar to, but not exactly the same as those out in industry. Um, we worry maybe most above all that our science is trustworthy. So the data, the computation, the results free from tampering, has anybody messed with that um, in some ways that maybe we can't, uh, can't detect? Uh, we also worry about <clears throat> being productive. Are the systems that we're operating free from interference? Are we getting our job done? Or are we being stopped from doing our research and are we safe are we presenting um, are our computers which may control things um, able to damage people or property or maybe produce results that are somehow misleading and would endanger people <clears throat> so when Alyssa and I talk about this uh, to groups what we one of the things we say and we teach our classes in this we say above all things security is an economic issue you have to balance the cost of providing some level of security against your ability to absorb the cost of an attack. And those attacks can have, um, in the science world, can have some very, very serious consequences. You can have a loss of data. And I'm talking about permanent loss, where um, your experiments have just completely gone non-productive. You can be stopped in progress. Um, so you can't do your science. You could produce results that are somehow incorrect, which would damage your reputation, even cause loss of funding. And somebody can manipulate your systems in a way that may harm your staff or harm the public. So these are non-trivial issues of why um, we worry about security overall, you know, uh, important results for trusted CI overall. <clears throat> now, um, cybersecurity is a huge field. Uh, there are just so many aspects to it, system security, identity management, network security, configuration, just to mention a few. So why are we concerned about software security? Why are we talking about that today? <clears throat> so what, we, what you see is the science community is developing a pretty steady stream of custom software specific for their needs and deploying it as services, infrastructure, data management, or just raw computation. <clears throat> And most of that software comes from groups with no real security 
team managing them and not a lot of formal security training. And so remember that each piece of vulnerable software that you deploy or each web service you deploy that's vulnerable could be a pathway to allow an attacker to own your system. And your software team is the final line of defense. <clears throat> so what I want to do is take you through a couple of steps. One is, first of all, thinking like an analyst, talk about this, and, um, and I'll switch off to elicit at this point. And then we're going to talk about, um, uh, after this, about how you as a software user, developer, provider should respond. Okay, so some basic things that we all know, just to review and get us kind of level set. All software has vulnerabilities. Um, uh, if, uh, if you think your software doesn't have vulnerabilities, um, we should talk. It does, and every vendor of software knows that, and they're constantly dealing with it. And the, the software we're developing to run our infrastructure is complex and large, and, and so it, uh, we know it has a lot of vulnerabilities, and these vulnerabilities can be exploited. <clears throat> now, there's this unpleasant asymmetry that the attacker chooses you know, how, when, and where to attack, and the defender has to protect against all possible attacks, even those that haven't been discovered yet, which means the attacker needs to only get one thing right to be successful. The defender has to get everything right. So <clears throat> we're intrinsically doing a harder job. <clears throat> now, what we're gonna be talking about today is something very important, the need for independent assessment. So software engineers have long known that testing groups must be independent development groups. And security testing is just another layer on the testing. You, you can't tickle yourself. You can't test your own security. It just doesn't work. You don't, you have intrinsic built-in blind spots and biases. Okay. So the other important issue that we've got to talk about right now is that an assessment process cannot be solely based on known vulnerabilities. It is good to look for known vulnerabilities, but if it's solely based on known vulnerabilities, the attackers may get ahead of you because they will invent new ones. Okay. So we, uh, under other auspices, we've been advocating the use of software scanning tools, static analysis tools are often called, things like Spotbugs, Coverity, Facebook's new inferred tool, which is pretty good. Uh, there's, a, there's hundreds of these for every language you can think of, PyLint, pick your favorite language, they've got them. But the, and these tools are essential, but they have limitations. They find some local errors, um, they'll miss some significant vulnerabilities, and they may produce a lot of false positives. So while you really must be using these tools, they are far, far from the end story if you're deploying critical infrastructure. Now, we also know that programmers must be security aware. We really want programmers who are designing with security in mind, not, at, not trying to do it as an add-on later on, that's very difficult, and using secure standards and practices. But those, even those, while they improve, while tools and security where programmers improve your level of security, they don't guarantee security. You still need this uh, independent assessment process if to be really confident. Okay, now um, people often confuse this assessment process with penetration testing. Penetration testing is bringing an outside team in to scan your environment, um, to look for common mistakes, look for what's known. So penetration testing is very useful. It is a great thing to have, and, and it's likely to find problems in your environment, <clears throat> but it won't find previously unknown vulnerabilities. It won't find application-specific issues. And in the science community, we're deploying a lot of custom stuff that's not just <clears throat> commodity, and it won't find design problems. So um, uh, we must, so we're advocating evaluating the security of our code to find the vulnerabilities. Um, In-depth code analysis isn't cheap. Automated tools will give you a partial solution and they're cheaper, but there's a big gap between what you find, but you need to send, and you can't take shortcuts. Even if your development team is good at testing, they can't do an effective assessment of their own code. <clears throat> Okay, so what we're gonna, um, what we've been using in, as our toolkit, as one approach, is something we developed called First Principles Vulnerability Assessment, FPVA. And it's a strategy that focuses on critical resources. It's not based on known vulnerabilities. It's based on identifying what are the critical resources, what are the um, 
key assets in your system and then looking for uh, threats that might uh, affect those. And the goal, so our overall goal is to, in, is to integrate in-depth code reviews and remediation into your software development process. And then later on have to be able to respond to it, which we'll talk about. So after that breathtakingly fast intro, um, Alyssa is gonna walk you through um, uh, the FPVA. So uh, FPBA, the basic goal is to find security problems in your software, to find uh, vulnerabilities that as was, uh, Bart was mentioning before, they uh, are there. And the general objective is uh, to make the software more secure. And next slide, please. FPBA is composed of uh, five steps. And I'll briefly go through those uh, five steps now. And the goal of the first three steps is to give the analyst an understanding of the big picture of the software and to then proceed to step four, which is kind of go and find the vulnerabilities. And five step is uh, about uh, understanding um, what we have, uh, what the analysts have uh, found. So I'll start uh, with uh, step one, which is the architectural analysis. Next slide, please. And in the architectural analysis, Basically, the analyst cares about uh, three, three things, which is uh, first understand, understanding the attack surface and the, uh, I've left the slide, okay. The attack surface uh, refers to any point the user interacts with the system. Then, the, um, in this step, we also care about understanding the structure of the system. It's okay, what uh, hosts uh, are there and what processes or threads are running on those hosts and how is the interaction among those uh, previous components I and mean, how and when and what is communicated um, amongst uh, processes or threads. And next slide, please. And uh, a key uh, issue here, as I was mentioning before, is the attack surface. Because uh, all attack will come from user supplied input, right? And otherwise we will be talking about malware, right? Just installing the software and then you have a um, security issue. So it's important and sometimes not very easy to understand all the places where the system uh, provide um, uh, user supplied. Uh, next slide, please. And after having uh, understanding again the attack surface, the structure, you know, as I was mentioning for host and process in the system and the communication between all those, we create a diagram. And um, the, and that diagram is a People usually think a diagram, oh, I can get that just from the, from the documentation. And things are way more complex than that. Next slide, please. Because usually documentation is not super uh, kept up, up to date. And it includes maybe some specific issues. But usually when we show these kind of diagrams, and I will show you an example of that in a, in a minute, um, the, the, the developers of the application are surprised because they usually understand the part of the software they are working on, but they don't understand the big picture of the, of the system. And currently, you know, systems are complex and they include um, actually a challenging point here is, you know, no one uh, starts building their software from scratch, right? So usually there is a um, software stack, which includes uh, frameworks, libraries, packages, and so on and um, understanding all your software, that's um, also so something that it's not uh, tricky. Next slide, please. And as a result of this step one, we produce a diagram like the one uh, shown on the screen. It doesn't matter here um, what uh, the, the labels of each boxes. Here we just want to uh, understand that, okay, we have different uh, hosts, which are the gray boxes, and on the host, we have different processes, which are the colored boxes. And there is communication, which we show uh, through uh, arrows. And 
uh, usually, I mean, this is a kind of a simple diagram. Usually, you know, systems are a bit uh, a more complex, but this is a diagram that uh, came from uh, one of our assessments in the in the past. And I haven't talked yet about the coloring in this diagram, but I'll uh, explain that. Um, that's part of step uh, three. But right now we are moving on to step uh, two. Next slide, please. And um, step two is about uh, resource identification. It refers to understanding the resources that are accessed by the processes from the previous step. And examples of resources are kind of uh, uh, data related ones like uh, files, uh, databases. Or another kind of resources, it uh, refers to physical entities like disk space or CPU cycles or network bandwidth, but also, and super important, um, is uh, specific uh, devices like um, sensors or instruments. And here we care about the impact surface before we were caring about the attack surface. and. Um, um, attack will go from the attack surface to the impact surface. That will be the vector attack. And the impact surface refers to the resource that will reach uh, by an attack. Next slide, please. By the way, if there are any questions, please uh, use the um, chat. Uh, the chat. So here in this step, we care about the resources uh, in the system and which processes or from which host uh, have access to that uh, resource and what operations are allowed on the resource and how critical the resource is. Because, you know, if it's, for example, a file, a log file that is not used for anything, even if the attacker gain access to that resource, that's not really relevant. But um, if there is, um, if there is, you know, some resources will be kind of more critical. And if an attacker have access to those resources, then it could be a uh, real damage. So we care here also, we, all this time we are talking about, our goal will be to have a focus search for vulnerabilities. So we, we are trying to identify here the uh, high value assets. Next slide, please. And as an example of the um, artifact produced at this step, here we have an and resource diagram, and on the top we uh, mentioned the process that have access to those resources. The triangles in this case refers to subtrees in the file system, and um, in this case we have a different resource here, which is the name pipe, which is a communication, communication mechanism, and the coloring will come from the uh, next step, which is um, trust and privilege analysis, but just so we don't have to go back to this diagram, note that a red refers to the root user, or the admin or super user, and a pink refers to a special user, like um, admin for this application user, and uh, green and blue refers to regular users, but different users. And next slide, please. And, and now we move on to step three, which is about uh, trust and privilege analysis. So here we focus on both the, res uh, the resources we were just talking about and the components we were talking um, on step one. So as for the components, we want to understand the privilege level uh, at which each component runs. That's why in that diagram we have, uh, for example, um, processes running as root in red, and depending on the user, we use a different uh, coloring for that. Uh, concerning resources, we care about how, how are they protected and uh, who can access them. And we also care about how uh, trust is delegated. Next slide, please. And um, in this step, we care about um, actually authentication and authorization. And as I'll talk a bit here about um, Authorization, it's basically where, which users can do what on the system. So there are some questions we need to answer. It's like uh, including what privilege exists in the system and about the mapping between the um, privilege and um, 
the operations on resources. And if the privileges are fine grained enough, it means like, for example, you need to access some information on the database. Oh, the minimum unit of information you can access is a whole table. Ooh, that could be problematic, right? And um, how are the privilege uh, enforced? And that actually, the, um, that's an issue that should have come even from the design step, which uh, refers to the less privilege principle. And it's basically, we give the user permission to the, uh, access the resources they need, but no more than that, right? Again, back to the, our database example, uh, if the user will have a need to have access to some specific rows of some tables, we give them access to that, but no more than that. And next slide, please. And uh, well, as a result of um, step three, we have the coloring in uh, our diagram, both the architectural diagram and the resource diagram. And with that, we understand the, basically the high value assets of the system and the critical components. And it's there where we will focus our search for vulnerabilities. Because even if we have kind of almost um, a super well-funded uh, effort, we will be, um, it won't be realistic to say that we can inspect every line of uh, code in the system. So here, uh, I, well, there was a goal to focus the search for vulnerabilities. Now we have done that. And um, now uh, we look for vulnerabilities. And the key point here is that we we'll go beyond uh, well known vulnerabilities. I mean, we care about those too, but we are not limited to those. So we um, see how the critical resources could be uh, exploited or abused. and also, we check, uh, also we care about um, well-known vulnerabilities and see how they can affect our resources. But also very important, we care about uh, vulnerabilities that can uh, happen from the interaction of the different components. And there is no tool that can give you that. And there is no uh, national vulnerability that database with uh, information about that. Next slide, please. And the vulnerabilities uh, we look for, it can be of uh, different uh, kinds, that there could be design flaws, and those are kind of really bad news because they are difficult to find and they're very expensive to fix. And again, no tool will help you with that. And uh, there are also implementation flaws, and uh, those are kind of more localized in the code, and there are, those are easier to fix. We focus on those, though we also pay attention to uh, operational vulnerabilities. That means uh, how is the configuration or uh, environment where the, our application is uh, running on. And also, um, uh, you know, social engineering attacks. It's a different world, right? I mean, basically tricking uh, users uh, to perform an attack on behalf of the attacker. But where we spend most of our effort is in um, design flows and implementation issues. Next slide, please. And as uh, for implementation issues, we care about um, well-known uh, vulnerabilities ranging from uh, buffer overflows, injection attacks, you know, all the web uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, all the way you know, from those well-known vulnerabilities to specific uh, problems happening in uh, particular software. And including, as I mentioned before, uh, complex vulnerabilities arising from the interaction of uh, different processes uh, in your system. And after we have found vulnerabilities for any vulnerability we found, uh, next slide, please, we, um, write a vulnerability report, and that's um, step five, the dissemination of results. We have one vulnerability per, one report per vulnerability, and we interact with the developers, uh, referring, um, uh, there's a question here, what are integer vulnerabilities? Yeah, those are, you know, buffer overflow, vulnerabilities related basically with pointers, 
and both uh, integer vulnerabilities, those refer, those um, are related to problems with uh, integers, which is kind of funny because integers look kind of easy and innocent, but you can have many problems with them, including uh, overflow, underflow, and um, others. We can talk about uh, that a bit more in the, during the questions um, time. This was a quick addition. If you increment an integer and it overflows, the, the CPUs don't report it. Those are silent. So if you're not careful in your code about how you handle them, you can go from a, a very uh, small positive decrement to a very large positive and end up with some kind of uh, array out of bounds or something like that. These are, these are very insidious, very common. And they don't sound, as Alyssa said, they don't innocent, integers sound innocent, but they're, they're not. We, we can talk more about that offline if you're interested. Um, so uh, back to step uh, five. Um, uh, yeah, and then we, we need to, uh, after reporting the vulnerability, we need to save time to um, make sure that the vulnerability was uh, fixed in the right way. And um, yeah, and uh, we also suggest mediations to the development team. And there we write the report in such a way that we have a summary that can be disclosed sooner than the full vulnerability details. Next slide, please. In the, here we have an example of an, a vulnerability report and we include a, a summary and we include some um, information including uh, how is it um, exploited vulnerability and how are the consequences of that vulnerability. And this is some, uh, all of this screen you see, this uh, is just uh, some summary information. And after that, we, the, we write uh, detailed information on how the attack can be reproduced. That's the second part of the, of the report. Uh, slide 34, please. And then after uh, we deliver the report to the um, development team and they fix the vulnerabilities and we have reviewed, analysts have reviewed that the vulnerability was fixed in the right way. There is a, a delicate issue about, okay, uh, about disclosing the um, vulnerability report kind of to the world, right? Sometimes uh, that's, not even possible, right? When there is a confidentiality agreement or if the assessy side don't agree to that. But in many cases, we usually, um, after the software have been patched and users have, been, have had time to um, uh, get the, the patch uh, version of the software, uh, usually, uh, that's not an absolute rule, but six months uh, after the vulnerability has been found, it's okay to release the summary of the vulnerability. And um, a year after, usually we can disclose the full report. But again, those are not absolute numbers at all, right? It depends, it, that's decided on a case by case base. And, uh, and we are talking here about a uh, proprietary software. If the software is open source, things get uh, way more complex, right? Because everybody has access to the, to the patch code, so it's easier to guess what the uh, issue was. So um, uh, now go back to Bart to talk about the uh, experience on the ACC side. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so we, we try to take you through some of the technical details, not because we expect you to, to do those, but to understand what the process is like that could be addressed to your software and what we do address to software. Um, we, if, you, if you have a team member that wants to learn these skills, we can also train these skills as well. But let's talk about what it looks like on the assess -E side when you decide mm -hmm. to have your software assessed which means somebody, we're going to take a, a magnifying glass, even a microscope to your work. So, so, um, so the goal is to have a plan, um, know what to do, know when vulnerabilities do come, and most often they do come 
uh, know what you're going to announce to whom, when, and how, how you're going to fix it, how you're going to deal with versions, um, how you're going to deal with security releases, you know, questions like, do you have a separate security release or combine it with other releases? The answer is a security release, just to give away the ending, and allow time for users to upgrade. <clears throat> so, so if, if you invite us in and say, please, let's assess our software, you invite in another team doing something similar to us, um, uh, getting started is really the hard part because there are so many reasons to say no. Um, and so I want to talk about those. Uh, what are the obstacles to doing this? Um, I'll talk about the, I want to talk about the vulnerability assessment process. What makes our life easy or perhaps makes our life difficult? And then what do you do when reports come out? And then remember that the uh, assessor in this case is on your side. It's, it's, it's not somebody trying to break into your system to harm you. It's somebody trying to find the vulnerabilities before the bad guys find them. Okay, so as our former first lady, uh, when she was talking about her drug anti-drug program, the answer was just say no. And that's what we run up against a lot when we uh, try to suggest to somebody they might want to do this assessment. Okay, so let's go through some of the reasons why you might want to say no. So um, your team says, we use all the best practices in secure software design, so such an effort is redundant. Um, and so based, something based on Erasmus, many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. Um, even the best programmer makes mistakes. Um, so no matter how good your design is, um, there, uh, the design may not be, may have, the implementation may have flaws uh, that don't quite implement the design. And then as, as Alyssa was mentioning, um, you can have two different components which look secure in themselves, but the way they interact may expose you to an attack, may allow access to your system, may reveal data. And, um, you know, the, even the best cases, uh, a good design only works with formal specification and verification, which is almost non-existent in the real software world. Okay, <clears throat> another obvious reason to say no is it's just too expensive. It takes months of time. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I can't afford it. Um, you know, uh, the old sports adage is a good defense, best defense is a good offense. Um, and so you really need to jump in there. You know, Mao Zedong had a variation on that, if you'll pardon me, quoting Mal. <laughs> so yes, it is expensive to do these. It does, can take months. Um, and yes, if you're successful, you'll see only an expense. It's, it's like, um, uh, you know, if you advocate, <clears throat> if you were a corporate security office and you advocated to your board, I need 10% of my month of our annual revenue to increase our software security game. And if you, they gave you that money, and if you were successful by securing the system and nobody would attack your system, at the end of the year, what you'd see is 10% less profit. Now, what you probably, what you didn't see is all the attacks that were successfully repelled and how your site didn't go down and maybe your, your, uh, um, your competitors did. So this is, this is like insurance. You know, you, you got to have it. And, if, and, and hopefully, if you're successful, you won't ever use it. So, but remember, the cost to recover after a serious exploit can be prohibitive. Um, and there's, there are many bad things that can happen that can be much more expensive than the investment. Okay, so another reason to say no to an in-depth assessment is uh, I'll run some automated tools. These things like Coverity, Fortify, Find, Spot Bugs, Infer, all these, uh, these various tools like that. <clears throat> so um, this is a little bit harsh, half measures of soothing and baffling expedience. Um, these tools are not baffling expedience. They are quite useful, but they don't give you, um, they don't give you the level of security you need if you gotta really trust your infrastructure. They, they raise the lower bound on, on your, your base level of security, but if you, you really need to dig into the code, if you, if you want to make sure your infrastructure is robust. And we actually did a study of this a while ago, comparing um, uh, automated tools to those that we found in in-depth um, vulnerability assessment and found many gaps uh, from the best tools of the day. And this, this situation has not changed. 
Um, we can't do a study like this again because all the tool makers in the commercial world prevent you from publishing results these days. So <clears throat> that's a whole other question. Okay, um, another reason to say no to doing this saying, well, if we report bugs in our software, we're going to look incompetent. Um, and uh, you know, Shaw, Shaw <clears throat> would, would um, Shaw would disagree with you, but here, here are the facts. All software has bugs in it. Um, and if a project isn't, re and, and if we're talking about security bugs, <clears throat> also all software has security flaws in it. And if your project isn't reporting these security flaws, either they're not checking for them, which is bad, or they're, or they're checking and not telling you about that, which is bad. So our experience, this is <clears throat> maybe one of the key things that in the whole <clears throat> presentation, so our experience shows that Users and the people that fund them are more confident when you're checking and reporting. Um, when we did an assessment of the software that controls 40% of the container shipping ports in the world, um, this company was very nervous, very competitive environment, but they went through and we found vulnerabilities, we fixed them, we reported them, and they ended up getting hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts as a result of being able to show people they had gone through this effort to increase the security of their software. So there was a case, we've seen this in the research world, increased reputation, the Condor Group, Rowan Libney has been a leader doing this early. Um, um, and, it's, and, and it's really been really pushed forward and, and it's increased people's confidence in his work. And we've seen in the commercial world. So we really, this 10 years ago, we used to say it and hope it was true. Now we know it's absolutely true. We've seen it again and again. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now the assessment team beams in and comes into your project. <clears throat> so what happens? So here's what, here's what makes our job harder. I'm going to say it kind of a negative way, just to be slightly cute, but <clears throat> um, we, we love documentation. Up-to-date and accurate documentation <clears throat> is our goal. Um, most projects, the software outruns its, its, its documentation. Um, there's so many, there's, we love software that's easy to install, um, and, but so, many so, so much software has complex installation procedures that makes it harder. In today's world, um, we, we often want to take a container or a virtual machine ready to go that can totally leapfrog us past those steps and let's start our assessment process right away. We want access to the full source code, and we want the development team to answer, ask, answer questions when we have them. Because we're, we're what's called a blue team, not a red team. A red team is an adversarial team. A blue team is one that you invited in to do this for you. So these things, you know, you can flip this over and these are things that make our job easier. <clears throat> um, when we do this, we follow the FPVA methodology. We work step by step. We work independently of your team to be unbiased. We ask lots of questions. We don't answer any questions because that can freak out your team. And it just takes longer than you think. Um, we don't, and we won't report a vulnerability until we can construct an exploit and show you that it's authentically a vulnerability. <clears throat> so then the vulnerabilities arise. <clears throat> so what do you do? Um, uh, how do you respond? Well, no, this is not really the right way. So how do you really respond? Well, you can respond in, in five steps. The first thing you first thing people do is they say, well, that's not possible in our code. We don't do those kind of things. Um, then there's people get mad at us and say, why didn't you tell me there were such bad things you could find? We're looking really bad. Um, uh, then there's the whole discussion of saying, well, we don't really have to tell anyone, do we? Um, and you eventually do. And then there's, oh, we're screwed. No one uses our software. Our funding agents will cut us off. We're um, we're terrible people. And then we move on and say, okay, let's figure out how to fix this. And, and once you get past those first four steps, we're all working in the same page and um, uh, it's, going, it's going fine. <clears throat> and it, it actually goes pretty well. Okay, so um, when boner reports roll in, whether they're coming from us or another source, outside users um, coming from, uh, somebody down your supply chain, um, you need to um, identify a team member specifically to handle vulnerabilities. They've got to be some point person. Um, 
And then you've got to develop an internal radiation strategy. Somebody who's going to understand the vulnerability report, understand it in the context of your system, to understand what its implications are. And perhaps because you know the system better than we do, you may say, oh, this vulnerability could actually appear in other places, generalize it. Um, we're going to suggest a remediation for it, and you're going to formulate your response to that. And then together as a team, we're going to try to come up with a fix. It's not a quick hack, but a, a real fix. And, and we actually work in interaction on, on you formulate response, we give feedback and talk about this. <clears throat> and once you've got vulnerabilities and fixed them, you have to develop a separate security patch release mechanism. We, we saw, we, 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 um, uh, we did an assessment early on for uh, an important system running at one of our, one of the DOE national labs. And we found, um, we found some serious vulnerabilities and um, uh, in the software. And then the group that produced the software um, produced an immediate, uh, uh, well, they were putting out a new release. So they put the security, so the fastest way to get the release out for them was to integrate the security patch in the new release. So a new release came out with the security features. And the group at the National Lab got really upset because they had two choices, either upgrade to the new software in, to get the security release in the middle of a main big run, and that made them very nervous to disrupt their science in the middle of a run, or two, run the current version of the software knowing that they've got a major security vulnerability. And so they're very upset. So the real answer is put out an immediate separate security patch for the current version of the software that's being distributed. Um, you may have to actually target more than one version depending upon your release strategy. And of course you integrate it upstream into future releases of your system. You have to develop a notification strategy. Who will you tell and when? Um, users are nervous during the first report. Um, but they become your big fans because they know they can rely upon you that you're looking at security and you're telling them about the issues. And so often you announce a uh, security vulnerability um, without any details um, at the time you release the patch. And then sometime later, you'll release the full details to the community after it's had a chance to update. Now, as Alyssa mentioned, open source makes this more complicated because as soon as you commit an update to your repository, that's a pretty good guideline as to where the security vulnerability is. Um, and so we just, we have to encourage in advance of that, we have to warn our constituents in advance of that so they're ready to do the update more quickly and maybe make the update available on a private channel to key users before you do final release. <laughs> okay, um, so what we're looking to cause is a change of culture in the development team. So when security becomes a first class task and reports start arriving, everybody's awareness is, increases. It changes the way the developers look at their code. When they start looking at these reports, they start thinking differently and they start writing code differently. And the, the major transitionary moment we look for is when your developers start reporting their own vulnerabilities they found in their own code. And that's really the key we've made this transition. Okay, well, we've jumped through a lot of stuff here. Um, and so I think this is a good moment for us to um, uh, slow down, take a deep breath, and we're happy to take whatever questions you might have. And Je Jeanette, I'll turn the screen back over to you. Thanks. Um well, so far we've had a comment that they're, they're really enjoying these slides. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about things that are coming up with Trusted CI while we can uh, let the questions uh, queue up. Uh, first, uh, if you have, uh, we're taking questions now, but uh, I have a little request for you. Please take our survey. I'm just gonna uh, post the link here in the chat real quick. And Jeanette, I've got the chat window in front of me, so I'll be able to see the questions. Awesome, thanks. Um, um, oops. And then um, just a little bit of news uh, about Trusted CI before we get to the questions. Uh, first, uh, PERC uh, in July 26th, or, sorry, PERC is July 26th through the 30th, and if you don't already know, it's moved online. 
Trusted CI is hosting a workshop and uh, we are accepting applications to present at our workshop. So let me just throw uh, that link in the chat as well real quick here. Um, and uh, the due date for uh, applications to join the workshop is June 1st, so please submit those. Also, uh, we have sent around a survey to gauge uh, community interest in our, our summit, the NSF Cybersecurity Summit, and that's in September. Uh, we will be posting announcements and results of that survey soon, so uh, no official updates yet, but be on the lookout for that. And then um, Trusted CI has uh, been sending around a survey about um, data security concerns and practices. Um, and so we are accepting uh, responses to this survey until May 31st. And let me just throw that in there real quick. One more link for you. Uh, and uh, this is to gauge uh, uh, responses about the, the practice of data security concerns. Uh, and we are seeking responses from all different types of people, scientific researchers, cybersecurity professionals, et cetera. So please, if you have time, I will be sending these links in our follow-up emails about the event as well. So let's go through, um, Let's go through these questions. If you don't mind, Bart, I'll read it out loud, uh, at least this first one, so that we capture it in the recording. Um, is there a step in your analysis where the code is treated as a black box system to provide an expected behavior set? Uh, I may have missed. So um, it's, uh, we, you can, we can do that as part of what, um, what, what was, we don't, we don't have it listed as formally. I mean, what a, um, what programmers will often do is they'll send random input to their program to see if they can crash the code, which will show that there's some internal state in the program that's not being correctly monitored. So people, we, of, we often do that as part of the uh, step four, where we'll, we'll, do, we'll throw some random testing tools at this thing to see if that's exposing just some initial code flaws in there. Uh, next question, how can you estimate the cost of an assessment? Um, well, the cost of the assessment is, is basically affected by the complexity of the code artifacts. So loosely, um, loosely how many lines of code, what language is in, and what kind of functionality it is. It's, you know, some, uh, some code that uses conventional web services um, is easier to understand than we did, we did an assessment on the singularity container system. Um, and which is very low level grungy system code dealing with some very uh, arcane interfaces to the operating system. <clears throat> so it's loosely the size, the number of codes, the number of lines of code that, um, that we, have, we have to deal with. Um, uh, Just but, wait one, one sec, for example, for the singularity example, that took us uh, six months uh, let's say one uh, full-time person during those six months, approximately. Uh, uh, half time. It was a it was a student. Yeah, right. But then plus uh, the management time as well. Right, right. So yeah, I'd I'd say from from something really small and simple, a couple of months to six months for something that's quite complicated. If you for con for concrete numbers, right? Thank you. Um, so that's kind of related. Uh, I got a little cl cluster of related questions. How big is your team? How many engagements do you do, say, per year? And the average duration of an engagement? So um, under Trusted CI, um, we, uh, Alyssa is the software assurance lead and supervises it, and we usually have um, one to two uh, half-time students working on that. Um, uh, we also do assessments under other guises um, and um, made a, other arrangements for others. But under trusted CI, it's uh, let, let's say two two people, and we do and we tend to take on one assessment per half year, and, and we we follow the trusted CI engagement um, schedule. So if you're interested in getting your code looked at. Um, 
be watching for the next solicitation for engagements and uh, uh, select in-depth code review as, as, as one of the things you'd like to do. Yeah, and in those assessments, given, well, I'm in some assessment, given that the amount of time is, let's say, determined, then the, the, the amount of uh, vulnerabilities or issues you can find, it's limited by, uh, by the time you have, right? Um, we have a, another question here. Containerized environments seem to open up a lot of base unknowns and more out-of-date software components. Any best practices here? Oh, this is a, this is a really good question. So let's just let's just stand back and take in general. Uh, in general, um, uh, having out of date components is a serious issue. And you know this is this is what we mentioned earlier. What's called the software supply chain problem, the software supply chain research management. And um, basically, and there and there actually um, one of the things you can do. There are tools um, like. Uh, the OWASP dependency check for Java program that will explicitly check um, the versions of your software, the versions of the packages that your software is dependent upon, and um, check to see if there's known vulnerabilities in, the, in known CVEs in the National Vulnerability Database on those. Um, so container tr containers is just the same thing. It's it's um, you're right. If you put something in a container, it tends to ossify, it tends to solidify. And um, there, you know, one thing is to have a clear inventory uh, as a developer of all the dependents you have, including what frameworks. We're, we're currently working on an assessment where um, the framework, the web framework, which the group is using is out of date. And they're not, and, um, uh, and it's actually obsolete. There aren't gonna be any more updates to that. So that's, that's, a, so that's something we've noticed and we're, we're reporting and we're looking at vulnerabilities that will never be fixed in there. So basically container environments in some ways are no different. Um, uh, and you have the advantages since you, re since you distribute the whole thing in one package, you have it in front of you in one place. Um, you're not gonna risk a user maybe using an up-to-date version of a dependence, not, maybe not using an up-to-date version. So you have, it's easier for us to look at as assessors because it's all in one place. And so I think, I think the container is an advantage because the boundaries of what's your code are more sharply defined. And we're not talking about um, what happens to be just installed in some place on your system for whoever uses your code. Uh, we have another follow-up question about costs, which I'm sure is a concern for people who are trying to budget these things out. Um, so are these uh, estimates uh, based on component size, number of user users? Uh, what are your components to assess the cost of the assessment? Uh, can you give an example? Thousands of dollars, tens of thousands? Um, uh... Well, we, 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 quanti we quantify the assessment time and people time. And, and so it's not the number of users that use the system, it's, it's really the size and complexity of the code itself. Um, we, we don't have any formal tools for doing this. We're trying, we're trying to make this more of a, right now it's a bit of a art and we're trying to turn this into more of a quantitative process. Um, so you, if you figure, um, it should take anywhere <clears throat> from, let's say, uh, a quarter to, uh, you know, a half FTE um, to do one of these assessments, and you can figure out what the cost of one of those are. Under Trusted CI, we we're 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 funded by the NSF to help the cyber infrastructure community. So if we take on your assessment, um, that's done as part of our funded effort. So that's a good incentive for you to join in and talk with us and take advantage of NSF's foresight in getting, getting you help for doing that. Um, I will say we are working as a separate thread on, on tools to help automate more of this process, to help automate the architectural analysis and resource analysis. And that's work that's in progress. So we hope 
uh, in the future to bring the overall cost of this down and give the analysts some extra hand in trying to tr develop these diagrams uh, by discovery, not by digging through the code themselves. Great, thank you. Um, we still have a few minutes left of the hour, so I'm going to do another call for questions. And while people are typing, um, I just have one more follow-up slide um, to view presentations like this one. If you enjoyed it, uh, you can join our announcements mailing list or uh, submit requests to present. All of those things, visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is June 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. And the topic is the research SOC. The research SOC is the Security Operations Center. And it is a fairly new program. I think it's a little bit more than a year old. And uh, this presentation will be led by uh, Susan Sons, who, who is also a member of Trusted CI, as well as uh, many other groups. Uh, so another follow-up question. Could you clarify what you mentioned um, with your answer about NSF funding paying for the assessment? Um, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, our, our time is funded um, in part through, uh, through the Trusted CI um, project. And uh, the Trusted CI project takes on engagements to do various different kinds of security reviews. And so what you've heard about in previous webinars, um, one of the kinds of uh, reviews we do is an in-depth, uh, these in-depth vulnerability assessments. And so, uh, and which, uh, is targeted towards the cyber infrastructure environment. So if you apply during the normal engagement cycle and uh, we're able to accept that, uh, our staff will work with you to do the vulnerability assessment. Now, any time for your programmers to help us out, of course, is, is things that you have to support, but our time is covered by the NSF. If you have a project that's outside of the cyber infrastructure world or in some other different area, um, you're welcome to talk to us about um, how you might fund that effort if we have the uh, available bandwidth to do it. Yes, and we just closed um, our, our um, recent window of applications and, and made our, in the process, I believe, of making announcements of our new engagement. So I would say uh, look for announcements uh, in the fall, the early fall, for a uh, request to uh, engage with Trusted CI. Oh, and, and, feel, and feel free, um, feel free to uh, um, contact Alyssa or myself if you have any software security questions. We have some video and text resources that I just dropped into the chat window. These are, uh, for those, the first thing we answered about integers, there's a module there on integers. You can read all about integers or watch the little short video on integers. And, we're, and these, these, are open, these are open resources, another aspect of our trusted CI work that we provide to the community. Yeah, and just to quantify time here, the videos are kind of 10 minutes long, so need to be scared about a super long video. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding me about your security course. And I also threw in a link to our software assurance page that has uh, links to your courses and other uh, blog posts and other related activities related to software assurance. And we appreciate everybody's attention today. So with that, I think we're going, to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alyssa. I know, I was going to uh, say thank you to everybody for uh, joining today. It was a real pleasure. Yes, I think, I think we, uh, we had some nice uh, back and forth with the audience. Um, so I wanted to thank you, uh, those of you who are attending. Uh, thank you very much for joining this presentation. Bart and Alyssa, thank you again for presenting. This, this, uh, this was very helpful, I think, for people in the software community. I will be posting a video about this later uh, today, as well as a link to the slides. So uh, you can find that on trustedci.org slash webinars. Um, and with that, um, I wanna say thanks again and have a great day. <laughs>